Okay, that was outstanding. Welcome everyone. As you come in, I just wanna welcome everyone to the Los Angeles County African-American Infant and Maternal Mortality Prevention Initiative, or AIM, countywide briefing. My name is Melissa Franklin. I'm CEO of Growth Mindset Communications. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that this week is Black Maternal Health Week, a week of uplifting, centering, and advocating for birth equity for Black women and birthing persons in LA County and across this nation. Um, Black Maternal Health Week was introduced nationally three years ago by a national organization, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, and to Los Angeles Black, by Black Women for Wellness. Uh, this year, with great gratitude, we are excited to share that the LA County Board of Supervisors passed a motion last month formally acknowledging this week, as well as within this week, Friday, April 16th, as the Day of the Black Infant. I would also like to thank our LA County District 2 Supervisor, Holly Mitchell, for introducing that motion. She has long been a champion for this work and we continue to be in deep appreciation for her and her office's efforts. So before we get started, I have a few notes for you. Um, one is that we are holding questions to the end of the event and then we'll give you instructions there then on when you can do that and how you can do that. Um, please also note that our panelist, Yolanda Rogers-Jones, has another engagement at 9.15 uh, a.m. So if you have specific questions for her, we'll be happy to follow up with you after event. So if you see her missing, it's not a te technical difficulty. She is um, heading to another engagement. Also, um, we just learned that um, uh, Michelle Saunders would not be able to make it, but uh, Raina Granberry, who we will be introduced to, will be sharing on her behalf. Um, and then for everyone that is here, finally, um, this is really important. Uh, we don't want you to listen this morning. We want you to lock arms with this work and find your place and how to transform not the people, but the system. Um, this includes our media partners who are here today. And I see some familiar names um, uh, in the uh, uh, participant list. And so welcome. Uh, this includes folks who have never had children, who never will have children. Uh, Dr. Allen will go over the statistics, uh, but over the course of a 10-year period, the difference in infant deaths of Black infants before their first birthday than that of white infants was almost 700 children, lives lost. Uh, we have repeatedly heard story after story of Black women who have perished uh, in childbirth or soon after. Uh, this is literally a life and death uh, situation, and we are relying on you to uh, spend time today to learn, to understand, to activate, to care about this work, to inspire others to care about this work. And I hope you'll be inspired by this amazing group of sisters in the struggle, co-laborers in this work who will be sharing with you today. And finally, I want to share with you as a uh, Black mother of two children born three months premature, who almost perished herself in their birth, that I'm so sorry if you have had this experience, if you have lost a child or if you have lost a loved one or if you've had a traumatic birth experience, please know that we hold you up as part of our village and we're here to support you. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Deborah Allen, Deputy Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, um, who will share county and health insights on um, black infant and maternal mortality. And so I'd like to invite Dr. Allen to turn her uh, camera's camera and microphone on. As we transition, I want to thank Dr. Allen for, uh, along with Dr. Ferrer, you know, firmly standing in this work, um, leading out this current um, rendition of this work, and just being um, fearless leaders in that regard. So, Dr. Allen, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, let me check that I can be heard. Um, uh, and, and I wanna recognize that this is three years almost to the day um, since, we, um, since the County Department of Public Health um, uh, announced its, its intent of uh, embarking on a campaign to reduce the black-white gap in infant mortality by 30% um, and set that as a five-year goal um, that we're tracking through 2023. So it's in that, in that framework, um, that I, I will be talking about sort of where we have come in the three years. Next slide. Um, and we, we have made a modest amount of progress already that's exciting to see, although we always have to be vigilant that 
statistics can can fluctuate over a year or even two years, and we really have to look for a trend. But what this slide shows, the orange line on top, represents Black infant mortality. We measure that as deaths per thousand live births of the same population of, of babies. And what you can see is going back to 2004, and of course, if the slide went back to 1994, 1984, 1974, you would see the same pattern. The numbers would be higher, but the pattern would be the same of a persistent Black gap in infant mortality, but a gap in infant mortality between Black women and all other women in the county who are clustered together um, at approximately one third the rate. Um, uh, and the other lines you see are women of Asian descent, um, Latinx women and white women all closer together. Next. Next slide. I want to highlight that while um, uh, we are, we are uh, uh, talking about infant mortality as well as maternal mortality because the two are closely slide, uh, tied. This is our week for focusing on black maternal health, which is really the fundamental underlying issue for both infant and maternal mortality. Maternal mortality, thankfully, is far more rare than infant mortality. Um, it's, we measure it in terms of deaths per 100,000 uh, 100, uh, 100, um, uh, pregnancies. Um, but what you see here is, uh, I'm sorry, by 100,000 people in the population, what you see here is an astonishing gap between Black women represented in the orange ba uh, bar and all other groups of women who on this are much closer together um, uh, than, um, than even on infant mortality. Um, and the, the dramatic difference in this is really what drives our work as in infant mortality. Next. So to, to grapple with that, to take that on, we have to ask the question, why is it happening? And this slide looks at some of the prevailing wisdom, the things most people think, and they are reasonable things, because, because each of these explanations is actually something that causes infant mortality. The trick is that it isn't something that causes the gap. It causes infant mortality, but it doesn't explain the gap. So let me, let me go through these quickly. So some people say, well, of course, there are Black-white differences in income. There's poverty, and poverty is clearly associated with poor housing, poor food, et cetera. Absolutely true. And if you look at white women and you look at Black women, you will indeed see that within each group, poverty explains a difference. Poorer women have worse outcomes. But when you look across race, what you find is that Black women who have private insurance, we don't measure income when we measure uh, health in the United States, but we do look at people's insurance status, and that's a marker for income. Because if you have private insurance, you or your provide your your partner or someone is in, is uh, employed, and Black women who have private insurance have worse birth outcomes than white women who receive public insurance. So while income is important, doesn't explain the gap. Similarly, for education, exact same pattern. What about mothers' behavior? Uh, is it that black women drink too much? Is it that they smoke too much? Is it they do other things that your doctor would advise you not to do? Well, both groups of women do things that are bad for babies, some women, some smoke, some drink. But what's very striking, overwhelmingly striking, because smoking, for example, is so terrible for infant health, is that black women who do not smoke, black women who do not smoke, do worse than white women who smoke. And that is just an overwhelming statistic to, to grapple with because smoking again is so bad. Now, if you look within each group by race, yes, of course, black moms who smoke do worse than, white, than black moms who do not smoke, absolutely true. But the fact that race overrides uh, smoking in explaining adverse birth outcomes is just a devastating reality. Um, and then what about access to healthcare? Again, the same thing. Uh, our birth certificates measure what we call adequacy of prenatal care, and the data show that Black women who've had adequate maternity care have worse outcomes than white women who don't. Um, so throughout these absolutely reasonable explanations for adverse birth outcomes, we don't find an explanation for the Black-white gap. Next. So what does explain it? Well, this, this complicated slide is a, is a clue. 
Um, what it shows you is that for white women, Latino women, Asian women, you see a sort of um, a sort of curve that uh, you see a, a, a pattern. This is women from the blue to the orange to the gray to the gold, et cetera. It's by age. So we're looking at the blue, the, the bright blue end at younger women and at the dark blue end at older women. Um, and what you'll see is that the curve swoops down in the middle for most of those groups of women, indicating that when women are 20 to 24, 25 to 29, um, 30 to 34, generally speaking, their outcomes are healthier than they are when women are in their teen years for all the reasons that we all know that we work to prevent, excuse me, work to prevent teen pregnancy. But when you look at black women, essentially what you see is an upward curve from the teen years through the elder years, um, which is, so, so for black women, teen birth is not the most dangerous birth. That is a very striking um, anomaly. And what researchers have come to, ex to explain that by is what they've called weathering. And what that, what that stands for is the idea that being a black woman in America is associated with such adverse experience that it ages you, it ages you before your time. So that a black woman who is say 20 is beginning to have the experiences of a white woman who is say 35 and already entering the period when pregnancy entails more risk. Um, next slide. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a pattern that we see um, that's been explained increasingly through research by a pattern, by a, a pathway that starts with adverse social experience, from that creates psychological stress, from that we get a fight or flight response so that the woman tenses up, that let us say it's a woman who walks into a store and is treated suspiciously by someone who follows her around. She has a fight or flight response. Let's say it's a woman whose landlord is harassing her in some way, um, or you know, in the context of pandemic, she's threatened with eviction. Let's say it's someone who feels the, the experience of discrimination on the job. All of those translate into the same physiological process of fight or flight and stress. And when that becomes cumulative, it begins to take a toll on every organ system in the body. And that's the pathway we see from racism, adverse social experience, to adverse birth outcomes, including adverse, uh, adverse health outcomes, including adverse pregnancy outcomes, but also um, including all of the chronic diseases that explain why we see um, Black and Latinx people dying more of COVID-19. All of that starts with adverse stress ex to which the mother is exposed at birth that then affects the baby's health. Next slide. So what AIM is about is, is um, parsing out that cascade of events and saying, what are we going to do at each step along the way to try to minimize um, the adverse impacts on black women so that we can equalize birth outcomes. And the first thing we wanna recognize in doing that is that um, racism is so pervasive a social phenomenon in our society that we can't make this a project, if you will, for one agency. This really has to be a movement and it has to include all sectors in the county. So that the first step in our efforts to address this white black gap um, is really around organizing ourselves to be part of a movement. And you'll hear about the structures that um, we've created with par partners who've been doing this work long-term, but we are now all doing to do it together um, in order to be part of that movement that we see on going on nationally in so many other fronts to address racism, but with our particular focus on how it affects birth outcomes. So that's strategy one, mobilize a movement. Next. Um, and this is just a depiction of that movement and you'll hear more about that. Next slide. Strategy two is to reduce the sources of stress in women's lives. It's, it, is always, it is always the best public health strategy to start up, upstream. It's the most humane because it means you don't expose people to the adverse conditions that are going to make them sick. And it is also the most cost effective because if you remove those conditions, as I said, you not only affect birth outcomes, but you affect 
our, the, the prevalence of hypertension, of heart disease, of diabetes in our society, all of which are tremendously costly, as well as tremendously um, damaging to quality of life and to, to longevity for the individuals. So what are our action steps to reduce the sources of stress in women's lives? Well, you'll hear more about these, but two sort of ways of framing it, sorry, back to that um, to slide two, uh, strategy two, yeah, are first to address material hardships associated with the history of racism. And there are some examples listed here that you'll hear more about. But the other is really to recognize that racism itself as an ideology takes a toll because it affects every social interaction that people have when they when black people come into contact with white people or people of other groups. Um, there is always a question of what will the racial content of that interaction be? And that becomes every single one of the encounters that has um, an adverse interaction involves uh, more of that flight or fright, flight flight or fright, excuse me, more of that stress. So a lot of emphasis in our work in public awareness campaigns, training, addressing implicit bias, bias, teaching people who are in helping professions how to recognize trauma so that they understand that as part of interactions, um, really taking on racism directly. Next. But recognizing that we will not be able to get rid of racism within the next two years or five years from our start, the question then becomes, what can we do to help women reduce the impact of stress? And um, the action steps you're going to hear here, you'll hear a lot about some of the steps we're taking in this area, really have a lot to do with sort of flipping the mind-body connection is what puts Black women at risk. It's the fact that psychological experience affects uh, physiological experience through the fight or flight effect. Um, so let's flip that and say, what can we do to help what Black women have um, the, the support, the tools, the mental health um, uh, uh, um, resources to avert those effects of stress. And that's a lot of that is about um, having helping people, having people with a positive supportive attitude around them. And these programs are really all ways of structuring that. They're also ways of giving people information and access to resources. But the essence of all of these action steps is um, making people feel embraced by a community rather than isolated, marginalized, stigmatized. Next. And then strategy four, is, well, we're not going to be able to provide enough support to assure that there's no phys physiological effect. Um, so then the question is really, um, what can we do in terms of medical care to um, uh, avert um, the adverse birth, in, uh, birth effects? And you'll hear about that as well. So finally, let me, let me wrap up, uh, next slide, by saying we've come an incredibly long way in three years in terms of creating all of these programs, um, all of this structure to work together, but the work is still to be done. If we achieve our goal of a 30% re reduction by 2023, we still have 70% of the way left to go. Um, so this is really the beginning rather than um, even the midpoint in our effort. And it will be a community-wide effort that will get us to birth outcome equity. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Allen. I, um, you know, as always, greatly appreciate uh, the grounding because it's so vital um, in how we approach this work. And the, your last comment about it will take a, a, a countywide effort to get us to birth outcome equity is really important. Um, I'd like to ask uh, to have the slides uh, brought up by the team, and then if um, the panelists could start to prepare to turn on their um, Camera. So Dr. Allen had ended with, uh, next slide, that this would be a countywide effort. And so it's important that I, I share with you like who we are. You know, the LA County AIM Prevention Initiative is um, a, a coalition of the LA County Department of Public Health, Health Services, Mental Health, First 5 LA, community organizations, mental and healthcare providers, funders, community members, our Black Infant Health, program and we're uh, and others and we are united in one purpose and that is to address the unacceptably high rates of black infant and maternal deaths in Los Angeles County and ensure access to healthy and joyous births for black families and you'll hear more about what we mean by joyous why that's important to share next slide please 
So in terms of our values as a collaborative, again, this is important to know because it's how we approach the work and we um, encourage uh, and invite our advocates. And remember, I said all of you all are um, united with us in the struggle now. Now it's time to lock arms to embrace these values, racism as a root, as a root cause, uh, Black women, Black uh, folks up front and leading in the work, informing the work, um, fostering equity while fighting inequity, and really just making sure that we acknowledge as we approach this work that Black women of all socio socioeconomic uh, backgrounds experience this injustice. Having a reproductive justice uh, lens to this work and value system to this work, um, honoring how, when, whether um, individuals have children, uh, anti-racism, anti-implicit bias as a frame, in particular anti-Black anti racism, right, which is a very specific type of um, and, uh, racism impacting us as Black individuals, acknowledging that we're all pieces of the puzzle, that everyone has a role and no blame game. So we approach this work not trying to transform the behavior of the Black woman, the Black pregnant person, but the behavior of the system. Next slide. And so we talked about the AIM flower, uh, Dr. Allen referenced that, um, which is really a, a place of solidarity. Um, the LA County uh, uh, AIM Initiative Steering Committee consists of these organizations um, and is a cross sector of um, um, black community leaders, um, public health and other county entities, First Five LA, a philanthropic arm, uh, Cheris Futures, our community action team le leadership and our doula advisory committee, and these are uh, some of the cross-section individuals who will be sharing with you today. Next slide. This is just a list of our steering committee uh, organizations. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Allen already covered, you know, what we've created together, which is quite a bit of momentum, in particular the launch of a village fund, which uh, Raina Granberry will speak about, our Cherish Futures partnership, uh, anti, uh, implicit bias and anti-racism training. Um, four community action teams formed across our county, the passage of Senate Bill 464, Dignity and Childbirth Act, uh, the doula program launched in approximately 400 families engaged uh, with a black doula uh, free, uh, free of charge and um, serving them. Tax preparation of events, um, perinatal equity initiative funding. So we'll go through some of these pieces, but I just wanted to give a snapshot of what has been accomplished to date. Next slide. And uh, finally, we just invite you to stay connected, but we'll bring these slides back on at the end so that you'll be able to um, uh, connect and follow with the movement. And with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists. I'm really excited to introduce this extraordinary group of dedicated and passionate uh, experts and how we address African-American infant and maternal mortality. Um, it has been an honor and privilege to work alongside them in launching um, this uh, initiative and uh, a number of them have been engaged in this work for decades um, and really are upon whose shoulders we continue to stand as we move forward in this work. And so I'm gonna introduce everyone real quick and then I'll turn it over one by one um, for each to share. So first is Raina Granberry, Perinatal Equity Initiative Coordinator for the Department of Public Health. Uh, Angela Jones, founding leader of, of African American Infant and Maternal Mortality Community Action Team for the South LA, South Bay region, and the LA County Department of Health Services Whole Person Care. Uh, she's a member of that team. Um, Michelle Sanders, who I mentioned wasn't um, here today, but she is here, yay, um, of our AIM Doula Program Coordinator, Department of Public Health. Brandy Sims, a Health Systems Program Officer for First Five LA. Yolanda Rogers-Jones, Coordinator of Black Infant Health Program for the Department of Public Health, and Dana Sherrod, um, Birth Equity and Racial Justice Manager for Cheris Futures for Black Moms and Babies for the Public Health Alliance. So welcome everyone. So we're gonna invite each one to share briefly. I'm gonna ask a few questions um, and then we'll move on to questions and answers. Um, just as a note for everyone, uh, I am gonna start with um, Yolanda Rogers-Jones uh, because as I had noted, she will need to um, leave a bit uh, before the, the uh, press conference ends. So Yolanda, if you wouldn't mind turning on your um, camera and your microphone, and then I can ask some of you. Thank you. You see me, Mel? Can you hear me? Yay, now I see you and I hear you. Wonderful, thank you, Yo. <laughs> 
<laughs> you are so welcome. Thank you. So, yo, if you could please um, tell us about um, Black Infant Health and what is Black Infant Health doing to contribute to raise awareness and create change um, uh, around Black infant and maternal mortality rate in LA County? Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for featuring uh, Black Infant Health, uh, the Black Infant Health program on the panel today. And very briefly, I'll share some highlights. Uh, the County of Los Angeles has delivered the BIH program services for over 25 years. And the program was established as a result of Senate Bill 165 of the Budget Act of 1989, when the Black infant mortality rate was 19.2 infant deaths for every 1,000 live births. Uh, key to the program's design was the developer's acknowledgement of Black culture, uh, their knowledge of history of Black people in America, and their familiarity with the social context in which Black women live and experience pregnancy. Uh, throughout the history of our program, the goal has been to improve infant and maternal health while minimizing uh, the impact of social inequities on Black women. To this end, Los Angeles County has enlisted the help of community agencies to serve as the face of the BIH program and to be the agents of change in their local community to improve Black birth outcomes. Black Infant Health staff conduct outreach in South Los Angeles, Antelope Valley, and the Pasadena area to inform the entire community about Black birth disparities. Outreach is about connecting with community residents, OBGYN doctors, churches, and a variety of other family supportive entities and agencies. The Los Angeles Black Infant Health Program is open to every Black woman, regardless of income. She has to be pregnant at least 18 years old, and she needs to be less than 30 weeks pregnant. When a Black woman enrolls in BIH, she'll be participating in our prenatal and postpartum groups where program staff will engage with her in a culturally affirming way that respects her values and beliefs. Uh, in Los Angeles, we have served over 10,000 Black pregnant women since the program's inception, and we have centered the Black maternal experience in our groups where Black moms are seen and heard and encouraged. Our groups of pregnant moms have very robust uh, discussions about our cultural heritage, labor and delivery, nurturing relationships, and we even talk candidly about racism uh, because it is very frustrating uh, to be ignored in maternal health settings, to hear folks discuss what they perceive are our struggles, and to know that Black mothers have not been included at the table as an integral partner in finding solutions that work for Black women. Uh, and it's on this foundation laid by the Black Infant Health Program that AIM will build and continue centering the voices of Black mothers' birth experiences so that the collective memory of Black women will be the evidence used to create change for Black moms and babies. And to learn more about the welcoming sisterhood of the Black Infant Health Program, people can go to cdph.ca.gov and search BIH. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much, Yo. I appreciate that and for you sharing this, uh, what has been a, a vital part of addressing this issue for um, many, many years and continues to do that centering uh, Black women. And so I just thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to invite Dana Sherrod of Terrace Futures. Dana, if you wouldn't mind. Turn it on Hi, your Lisa. microphone. Good morning. Good morning. Love the color shirt popping. <laughs> Thank you. Dana, could you please share a, a brief description of uh, Terrace Futures? And then if you wouldn't mind, share, um, you know, uh, what are some of the root causes behind the Black community disproportionately being at, impacted by higher rates of infant and maternal mortality? I know Dr. Allen shared, but if you could, from your perspective uh, um, as a point on this work with Cherished Futures. 
Sure, absolutely. And thank you so much, Melissa. I really appreciate the grounding that we had this morning that Dr. Um, Allen and you, Dr. Franklin, provided. Um, and so I just, I want to kind of start with your first question about some of the root causes. And a lot of what we hear, sort of the common response is that Black women have higher rates of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, greater social disadvantage. Um, but when we look at the literature, we see that these uh, reasons actually don't explain this gap that we're seeing between uh, Black and white birthing outcomes, as, as Dr. Allen mentioned uh, in the beginning. And in fact, the research is increasingly pointing to racism as the root cause. You know, as Black women, we are overexposed to racism, and I'll add gendered racism uh, and discrimination from the time that we're children. Um, and we are exposed over the course of our lives, and we live in this racialized society. Um, which contributes to the weathering of Black bodies, as Dr. Allen had talked about. And this weathering, you know, it unfortunately impacts our overall health and our birth outcomes. And, you know, as Dr. Allen mentioned, this, this experience really cuts across lines of education, our income. That means that, you know, as Black women, we can't educate our way out of this. We can't uh, earn our way out of these inequities. Um, and so, you know, really looking at racism and naming racism as the root cause. I also want to just call out that Black women have differential experiences interacting in the healthcare system. Uh, we are, you know, more likely to experience biased care. And so studies actually show that Black women are more likely to report being treated unfairly because of our race and ethnicity when we uh, look at in comparison to women of other racial and ethnic groups. So Dr. Franklin, as you mentioned earlier, you know, when we think about what can be done, it isn't about what black women or birthing people need to do differently. You know, really it's instead that we look at how we change the system to create institutional change and accountability. And that's exactly what we're doing in Cherished Futures for black moms and babies. It is the initiative that I have the great honor of leading. Um, and in Cherished Futures, we're working with a multi-sector collaborative group. So we're working with hospitals, you know, our partners at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, health plans, and Black women community leaders, many of whom are on this panel today as our advisors, our community advisors. And together we are looking at, you know, ways to advance systems changes uh, sort of across three domains, if you will, or three levels, which is the clinical level, the institutional level, and the community level. We know this issue is multifaceted, and so it requires a multifaceted approach. And so as part of Cherished Futures, we are working very closely with three particularly high volume hospitals here in Los Angeles. Um, and they are implementing change strategies across those three different levels that I mentioned, really with the goal of reducing black infant deaths and improving the patient experience and safety for black mothers and birthing people uh, in LA County. So for more information about Cherish Futures, the work that we are rolling out through the hospitals and health systems, along with our partners. Uh, folks can visit www.cherishfutures.org. Thank you so much, Dana. I, I appreciate that. And thank you again for calling out that we're not trying to change the behavior of the person. We're trying to change the transform the system and how it comes together on uh, our behalf, our community's behalf. Um, and I'm greatly appreciative of, of Cherish Future's work in uh, seeing that happen uh, in the county through hospital systems. And so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Adjua Jones. Um, and that's actually a perfect segue, right? And we're talking about how do we um, address these gaps on a countywide level, on a, a system level, a sector level, and on the community level as well. And so Adjua, you could, Turn on your microphone, um, please, and, and we'll tee you up. And while we do that, my question to you is, um, could you tell us about uh, the community action teams and what are they doing to contribute to raise awareness and create change uh, around black infant and maternal mortality in LA County? 
Thank you, Dr. Franklin, and thank you, everyone. I'm glad to be here on this morning. So what I'd like to share is the impetus for the community action teams and the vision that was um, came to me, uh, came about as a result of my role with Whole Person Care with Department of Health Services um, in the regional collaboration team. And our role there was to establish community action teams if there were none in place, or to support those in place so that we would help to build the infrastructure of organizations that were already in existence, also to identify the gaps in services and resources. And so because of my experience and background in maternal health and reproductive justice, uh, being one of the first, uh, actually the first community health worker and perinatal health educator for the Black Infant Health Program, the first of which was Great Beginnings for Black Babies. And I was there working under the, uh, that, that umbrella with the Inglewood Healthy Mothers and Babies Program in the early 90s when we were first addressing uh, Black infant mortality. And we had a major focus on what the moms were or were not doing, right? And so a lot of that partnership were with black doctors and some community agencies and resources. But in this establishment of the community action team, now seeing that um, back in 2017, 2018, there were films coming out, documentaries like Death by Delivery. And then you had the story of Shalon Irving. And so when uh, Jan and I from Black Women for Wellness first collaborated for to bring the Black Maternal Health Week here, in uh, Los Angeles County in 2018, some of the conversations, and I remember introducing Shalon Irving's story from uh, Nina Martin's ProPublica NPR Lost Mother Story. And it looked at the fact that this was happening across all socioeconomic factors, right? And this was happening with black women that were highly educated. Uh, Shalon Irving had uh, her bachelor's, she had two masters, a dual doctorate and was working for a CDC and died within weeks of delivering her child in her thirties. And so my, um, the thought and plan and conversations with DPH and DMH was to establish a community and government partnership, right? To address infant and maternal mortality. Seeing that in our county that we had been doing this work since the 90s, but I had never seen us get to a halfway point for infant mortality. And that's no blame to a specific um, group at all, but it has to do with our nation and this system. So in establishing the community action team, we had um, meetings in 2018, our first launch in October of 2018 in partnership with Kaiser, working with several colleagues from public health and we're able to, and, and some of my colleagues, you know, are still working in this today. I co-lead with Nancy Rodriguez. I co-lead with Diamond Lee. And this partnership was to look at bringing community and government together, bringing moms to the table, bringing fathers to the table, bringing clinicians, doulas, nurse midwives, even professors, and whoever in the community were, was or was not aware of this or, uh, of what was happening, what has happened to black moms, what has happened to black infants. You know, the comparison from CDC is that, you know, we're dying at three to four times the rate of white women, but that in comparison, what was highlighting for me and knew we needed to do something is that they put it in another way in that article was 20, we were 22% more likely to die from heart disease, 71% more likely to die from cervical cancer, but 243% more likely to die from pregnancy related causes here in the United States. So putting that community action team together, going out and doing outreach and real grassroots efforts um, to call together this community has really um, been a labor of love, but it's also been a passion to see that we can come together. We who are impacted by this issue can come together and address this from organizations that have been doing the work, Black Women for Wellness, Healthy African-American Families, California Black Women's Health Project, and the list can go on and on. But these were organizations that have been involved in this since um, really the early 90s and 2000s. So that has been the impetus for the community action team, which really launched off some greater work and has built a great partnership. We've done um, so many 
you know, we've even been able to pivot in COVID with virtual offerings and just a lot of community engagement. Grandmothers are becoming doulas. We have Black Daddy Dialogue. We really engage with the father. And so our community members are saying, yes, we are here for it. We want to address the system, systemic oppression and racism that has long impacted our lives. And we are the descendants of the African slave here in America. And we're looking to see a uh, fruitful change and to change this over uh, a longer period of time. So I'll end with that and be grateful. And, and I'll say that I'm very grateful that we have established three other community action teams, Antelope Valley, AIMCAT, was established in 2019. We also have the San Gabriel Valley AIM CAT and the San Fernando and San Clarita, Santa Clarita Valley AIM CATs that were established in 2020 and are being led by our Department of Public Health partners and colleagues. Thank, Thank you so much, AJ. I, uh, as always, appreciate your providing the historical context and um, the roots of this work. And so thank you for all your work on the community action teams and all of our community action team uh, colleagues who I know some of them are in this press uh, conference uh, today. Um, and, and if anybody wants to learn more about them, you can go to www.blackinfantsandfamilies.org. Uh, you can learn about the Black Infant Health Program, Terrace Futures, the community action teams, join a community action team. If you're inspired to get engaged, uh, that is the best first place to start. And with that, I'd like to invite Raina Granberry to the microphone. Um, Raina, if you would mind, please. I am here. Thank you. And as we do that, I, I do have two, a two-part question. Um, one is, if you could please share, you know, what personal experiences have brought you into this type of work? And then speaking of that work, could you give us a brief overview of um, what PEI is, the Perinatal Equity Initiative, and what it has to do with this? Absolutely. Am I having an echo? Oh, there it is. Great. Um, so good morning. Yes, I'm Raina Granberry with the Perinatal Equity Initiative. Um, and just to share a little bit about me and how I come to this work, um, I was um, a recent college graduate, um, had a very loving partner. We were very excited, planned pregnancy. And um, I knew very early on that some things just weren't right. I called myself going to Beverly Hills to get the best care possible because if that's where rich people are being cared for, I know I'm gonna be well taken care of there. Um, but I quickly noticed that um, being in that area was not going to help me um, and that I was discriminated against. I was othered, um, you know, even just walking into the building, it, Folks were kind of looking at me like, what is she doing here? I was on Medi-Cal. So, you know, being discriminated uh, on that, being a low-income mother. And um, so one morning I woke up and uh, I woke up in the morning and my stomach was really hurting, which what I know now is uh, was cramps and, and labor. It was labor pains. Uh, I called my doctor and they told me, you're just a new mom. It's okay. Wait till your appointment in two weeks and we'll see you then. Um and I was already being turned in and out of their door uh, in five minutes. Every point, no appointment I had was longer than five minutes, although I had expressed, you know, um, concerns about my pregnancy. And so the, um, that morning after I made the call and they told me, don't worry, uh, come in two weeks. That night I went into preterm labor uh, and gave birth to a, a stillborn child, my son, my, me, my husband and I's son. And um, it took me a few years, you know, deep depression, serious depression and um just took me a while to realize you know i got involved when i got pregnant again with the black infant health program um and got the support there i was a participant and i started to realize as they were talking to me oh wow you were discriminated against it's, it was racially based um in the way i was cared for and i decided that i didn't want that to happen to anyone else it, it was it was horrific and traumatic um and then i had a second instance uh, of preterm birth in which no one was listening to me when i was telling them that um i was going into labor once again and my son ended up having his cord wrapped around his neck and we went into an emergency c-section i didn't wake up until two hours later and my son was already here um so it, then i said no i must get involved in this work i ended up at great beginnings for black babies just like adjua um and be doing work there and then became a, a facilitator in the Black Infant Health Program after being a participant. So I'm just so happy that this initiative um, has done, is beginning to do and, and, and helping the county along in 
um, bringing black women up front and center. You know, you, you looking at me as a person with lived experience and saying you are an expert and we need your expertise here in the county and in these initiatives. So I'm just super happy to be here and on the backs of, you know, uh, Yolanda and Ajua and all the folks who came before me who, who make it possible for me to be up front and leading. Um, and with that said, I can talk about the Perinatal Equity Initiative. Um, the Perinatal Equity Initiative is a state-funded program that the legislature uh, came up with uh, as a part of their budget, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2018, in the Budget Act. And it was uh, uh, created to be a supplemental and a support program along with the Black Infant Health Program, um, that there will be sort of these two things happening at the same time to support uh, Black moms, babies, and families. And so um, it has, you know, the same... Um, these are the same goals we have in the AIM initiative are the goals that the PEI program has. And then the PEI funding from the state in our county funds a lot of different portions of our initiative. So um, we have our village fund and the community grants, which you'll hear a little bit about, um, is funded through PEI. We address some of the social determinants of health by doing uh, paid family leave and earn income tax um, education as well as um, support. We also have um, some interventions, our group prenatal program, which will be in um, working with uh, Charles Drew University. We have our fatherhood support program that is beginning, and we just got our fatherhood, a lovely consultant on, a black dad with much experience from Compton, who we're so happy to have along with us. We have preconception health and planning. We also um, have our hospital quality improvement work that we're doing with Cherish Futures, as you met Dana. So there's all these pieces going along. There's a training component. The PEI funds also support the community action team work that you heard Aja was speaking of, as well as our countywide steering committee. So that is a PEI program. Um, we are in our second year of the program and you know, just looking to continue to get support um, both financially and just village support to uh, continue this and have sustainability in the work to save uh, Black moms and babies. Thank you. And thank you, Raina. And thank you as always for um, just being willing to share your story. And as you know, so many of us in this work, we look around uh, to the person next to us that we're holding hands in the work and they have the same or a similar story and that story, I appreciate you're offering it as um, seed sown and to hopefully change in, in this work. And speaking of amazing folks in this work, I wanna invite Randy Sams, B. Sams, if you could come to the microphone virtually. Um, and I have my question for you is, you know, what is the new vision for Black Infant and Maternal Health that AIM is hoping to make real in LA County? Good morning, Dr. Franklin. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I think that if you ask each of us in the AIM Collaborative what our vision was, you'd probably get a lot of different answers. Um, we're not a monolith, just like Black women are not a monolith, and our expectations of the experience around birthing and parenting is diverse. And I think we really want the diversity of women's needs and desires around that experience to be respected and supported. And with that said, um, our vision really is grounded in reproductive justice which is defined as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children that we have in safe and sustainable communities. So as a vision, we want Black motherhood to be celebrated, uh, not just by our families, but by the systems that are responsible for our care. We want mothers to be aware of the risks and the root causes without the guilt from generations of being told that the outcomes that we're getting is our fault. Um, and we want the resources and support to make that information empowering. Um, I think of Nina Simone and how she was asked what freedom was to her and her response that it, she was basically saying that it was no fear. Um, and I think that's what we want for our families. We wanna be able to birth without fear, fear of death, harm, bias, indifference, judgment, or even debt from pursuing the birth experience that matches our vision. Um, and we want women to be active decision makers in their birth experience. We want sustained access. That's access to doulas, midwives, mental health providers, lactation consultants, community-based care, and other supports that are proven to improve health outcomes and experiences. And we want those providing community-based supports, which are usually other black women, to have a living wage and their expertise to be acknowledged and reimbursable through insurance. 
This is a real um, we want that community based care to truly be integrated within the healthcare system. We want doulas and midwives to be welcome inside hospitals as part of the care team alongside ROBs. We want hospitals to know their data and to disaggregate it by race and act on what they find. We want diverse providers that provide culturally competent care, and we want trusting relationships with those medical providers. We want support with preterm birth or loss, and we want time to heal and bond with our children without risking our jobs. We want county agencies, hospitals, health plans, medical providers, policymakers, media, philanthropy, and community-based organizations to all be on the same page about this vision and to be working toward it collectively with a system of, with a, uh, a sense of urgency and accountability. Um, and we wanna craft policy that creates that urgency and accountability. We want the opportunity to just kind of soak in the wonder of birth and parenting from a position of authentic safety and autonomy. And we want system transformation, we want justice. Um, here at AIM, we believe that 400 years of these disparities is enough. And I'm really proud um, of our sister leaders of First 5 LA, the Department of Public Health, um, and all of our community-based partners for really walking arms to make this vision a reality. Um, and we're hoping that all of you listening in will be willing to do the same um, as we work for this collective goal here in LA County. Thank you, Brandy, very well said. And I think in all of that, we heard the system needing to transform, right? And that the village uh, coming together on behalf of Black families. Um, so well put. Um, with that, I'd like to invite um, someone who represents one, uh, a group of individuals who are a part of that important village of support, uh, Michelle Sanders from the LA County Department of Public Health AIM doula program. Michelle, if you could uh, turn on your mic in your video, please. Good morning. Good morning. And so uh, after Michelle, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, uh, just make a note or call out that, that we'll have question and questions and answers uh, after Michelle's piece, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, hi, Michelle. Thank you for Good being morning. here. Thank you uh, for I have having me. A question for you is, could you please tell us about um, the um, AIM doula program and what is it doing to uh, contribute to and raise awareness in order to create change uh, around Black infant and maternal mortality rate in LA County? How is the AIM doula program um, working to advance that change? Uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so proud of the work that the AIM doula program is doing. Um, the AIM Doula program launched in November uh, 2019, and we had a cohort of about 14 Black doulas who were ready to uh, go to work and provide support to Black and African American women all across Los Angeles County. Um, we set out to provide doula support to 360 birthing folks and their families in Los Angeles County. And uh, that support came in the form of prenatal visits, um, continuous labor support, and also postpartum visits, which include um, lactation support. Um, we also um, do a mental health screening with our clients and refer out as needed. And uh, we address um, other needs that our clients have um, so that we can try to focus on a healthy pregnancy. But ultimately, uh, as doulas, our job is to educate. Uh, we want to educate people about um, all the things that come along with being pregnant, birthing, and raising babies, um, and specifically for Black women so that they can make an informed decision about their care. Um, as Brandy mentioned, like, you know, sometimes, you know, people just don't know the unknown. There's a fear of the unknown. So as doulas, we work to really educate our clients um, on the things that, you know, may come up so that they, number one, um, know what the medical professionals are talking about, um, and so that they can decide how they want to proceed. And um, so, like I've mentioned, we had a cohort of doulas who went into people's homes, and we helped them with birth plans. We helped them um, identify their village and activate their village of support. We helped them prepare for labor. Um, we were in the hospitals providing in-person continuous labor support where we would stay there with the client until the baby's born up until a few hours after. And then we followed up again with home visits um, in the postpartum. 
And so, you know, we did this, we um, ended up serving close to 400 people during our pilot program. And now we've transitioned into um, our permanent program, which, um, you know, we aim to serve an additional 500 families. And doulas have been around forever. It's not a new thing, but a lot of people didn't know what doulas were. So we're raising awareness about what doulas are, how they can help you on your journey. And also we provided uh, trainings for people who wanted to become doulas, who wanted to become lactation educators and offered this for free to the community so that we could um, you know, increase the workforce and as Brandy mentioned about, you know, the doulas receiving a paying wage, a living wage. Um, we want people to look at doulas as professionals and understand that this profession is very taxing on us uh, physically and mentally. And doulas deserve to be compensated. Like this is hard work that we do, but we have families. And so we want doulas to be compensated so that they can do this work um, full time and really commit to it. And we've seen that play out um, since the pilot launched and, you know, going into the new program, how, you know, these 10 doulas that we have now, they work so hard. Um, they're attending a minimum of two births per month. They cover all of Los Angeles County. Um, and, you know, we see them doing the work and making um, change. You know, we hear from clients that, you know, they, didn't know what they would do without the support. We hear from clients that even though um, it wasn't the desired outcome, the support was so, so important. So having that woman there, having someone who looks like you be a part of your journey and be a part of your care team is really important. And so, um, you know, we have now the opportunity to continue this work, to, um, you know, build a platform for doulas to be recognized as an important part of the care team. And, you know, we're here to collaborate with the providers. We're here to collaborate with the different community organizations because together all of us can see a change and a reduction in black maternal and uh, infant mortality. As a black woman, um, a mother, a doula, myself, a surgical technologist, um, I've seen it from all angles. And so, um, you know, we have some doulas who have different backgrounds and we all bring a lot of amazing qualities to this work. We try to match people with doulas who are a really good fit for them. And, um, you know, so we have doulas who some are younger, some are more mature, some have, you know, 10 plus years experience and some have, you know, been doulas for three to five years. But overall, um, I can say that the AIM doulas have really been getting the work done and we are open and welcome to receive more referrals. So if you have anyone who's interested in being connected with the doula for free, um, you can go to blackinfantsandfamilies.org as Melissa mentioned and um, find out more about the doula program. You can find out about the doulas there and you can request to be connected to a doula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I mean, you covered um, quite a bit of richness within that time, and I appreciate your taking time to share uh, an, a, an important anchor part of our work. And with that, I'm going to, we just gave you um, a sampling today of all the amazing work that's being done across the county um, by our uh, collaborative partners, by the community action teams, our county partners for 5LA, Cherish Futures, um, we uh, didn't uh, get a chance to get into the village fund, which is community informed, created, determined uh, funding that has been um, distributed to community based organizations that typically wouldn't receive funds from large organizations in partnership with the LA Partnership for Early Childhood Investment. There's so much uh, with this work. And so we just uh, invite you to um, you know, please take a moment to drop any questions into the chat we will follow up with answers but we are going to wrap up um, please do follow us on blackinfantsandfamilies.org um, if you go to forward slash bmhw 2021 you can see all the events that are happening this week as well as updates um, follow along on our social media channels we'll be posting all the various offerings of this week uh, information on there and also we invite you to lock arms with us beyond this week you know talk about it, be about it, join a community action team, 
um, uh, under, take time to understand in deeper ways what this work is about. And so we just thank you. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, as always, I appreciate and continue to be inspired by you and your work and our fellowship in this work together. It's a hard work, but it is a heart work. And so I just uh, thank you. And uh, we will, with that, we will close it out.